I'm going to tell you about a patient, but it's not a patient that I saw. It was a, I work at a county hospital, and this patient was seen at the university hospital. But the case was very important and was published by the infectious disease people who cared for the patient. So it was a 63-year-old man who had very severe heart failure, and he had a heart transplant. His initial therapy for the heart transplant for immune suppression was antithymocyte globulin and methylprednisolone, and then he was maintained with immunosuppression on tacrolimus, mycophenolate mofetil, and 25 milligrams a day of prednisone. He had emigrated from Ethiopia 29 years previously, and he had had a prior GI evaluation before his transplant, which was normal, including a normal colonoscopy. But two months after his transplant, he became very short of breath. He had vague abdominal pain. He had nausea. On examination, he did not have a fever, but he was breathing very rapidly. And on room air, his oxygen saturation was only 92%, and his blood pressure was lower than it should have been at 108 over 58. Laboratory evaluation, his complete blood count was normal. There was no increase in eosinophils. And a chest x-ray showed bilateral interstitial infiltrates. The second day in the hospital, he rapidly declined, and he needed to be intubated and put onto a respirator. On the third day, he had a bronchoscopy, and they showed they saw a lot of bleeding into his alveoli. They drew fluid from there. Um, there were no bacteria, fungi, or parasites, and they did a PCR for a respiratory syncytial virus, and that was negative. Blood cultures were negative. Urine cultures were also negative. He was treated for sepsis with stress dose steroids, 80 milligrams a day, but he required pressors in order to maintain his blood pressure, and at that time an infectious disease consult was obtained. They repeated the sputum, ova, and parasites, and this time they did see larvae, filariform larvae of strongyloides stercoralis, which is what you would see here this is actually from a lung specimen. And when they went back to look at the sputum on the first day, they saw that it was there as well, but they had missed, the lab had missed it. So they started by giving him ivermectin therapy, crushing up the tablets and giving it into an NG tube. But by this time, it was too late, and the patient died the next day. And at autopsy, he had disseminated strongyloidiasis hyperinfection syndrome. And of note, he had not had a serology done be before the transplant. So was there any clues for this? He had had one account showing a transient increase in eosinophils before his transplant, but the biggest clue is that he had emigrated from a high-risk area. And this case changed the practice at our university hospital so that now serology for strongyloides is done in all patients who are high risk before any sort of solid organ transplant. So this organism is a nematode that can live in humans and it can be silent and live dormantly in us for decades. And because it lives in the small bowel, you can get an auto-infection syndrome. So the organism infects us again if we become immune suppressed. So there are two types in the life cycle. There's the free living form, and this is the non-parasitic form that uh, lives in the soil. And then the non-infective larvae that can molt in the humans. These infect, then they become infective larvae, and then they can penetrate the intestine, and that's when you can get this auto-infection or persistent infection or hyperinfection syndrome. So transmission is either from the soil to the skin or fecal orally by eating contaminated uh, food. The larvae go from our lymphatics into our lungs, and then we swallow them if we swallow the sputum, and they can get to the GI tract that way. And the larvae in us become adult females, and they typically live for about five years and secrete eggs. If you get the infection through the skin, the organisms can migrate to the GI tract. It takes them a month. <laughs> 
And it's estimated that worldwide 100 to 200 million people have strongyloidiasis. It is much higher rates in Southeast Asia, 30 to 90 percent. But again, a study from the Amazonian area of Peru suggested that the prevalence was 8.7 percent and has been reported in the Caribbean and in Colombia. So the life cycle here is uh, that you can see the indirect development in the soil. The uh, larva can penetrate the skin, usually in the foot, and then they migrate to the lungs, and then we swallow that sputum, and the adult organism can burrow into our small bowel, and it can be secreting these eggs for five years, and those, of course, then uh, in the stool can go back into the, uh, into the uh, environment and be another source for infection. So the acute infection, not the hyperinfection syndrome, but the acute strongyloidiasis is typically itching and cough and nonspecific GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. The skin rash is called larva currens, and this is a picture from the Center for Disease Control website, and you can see this migration of these organisms under the skin. You can get chronic infection, and this is very nonspecific in terms of its symptoms with vague abdominal pain, alternating diarrhea and constipation, occult blood in the stools, malabsorption, and 50% can have no symptoms. I diagnosed a case of chronic strongyloidiasis a number of years ago in a man from South Vietnam who had very vague abdominal pain, some colon wall thickening on colonoscopy, and an ileocecal valve that looked for all the world to me, like he had tuberculosis. But the cultures were negative, he did not grow a tuberculosis, and my infectious disease people were smarter than me and ordered a strongyloides serology, and uh, that was positive, and he was treated, and he was better. So you can have chronic, sm uh, chronic uh, colitis, uh, although small bowel infection is much more common. The biopsies showed a lot of granulomas, but did not show the organisms. But the autoinfection is really the syndrome that's the emergency. And what happens is that these non-infective rabiditiform larvae become these infective filariform larvae, and millions of them are released and can go to the skin. And the risks for this are being on high-dose steroids, as our patient was, having HTLV1 infection, HIV, or a solid organ transplant because of the immune suppression. So in this hyperinfection syndrome, the larvae in the duodenum proliferate. They migrate through the bowel wall. They can go not only to the lymphatics, but they can go to the venous system, to the lungs, and then from the lungs to the small intestine. The typical pulmonary symptoms are wheezing and cough, and our patient had respiratory failure, and you can also see petechiae. The GI symptoms are very nonspecific, abdominal pain, diarrhea or constipation, you can see an ileus, and you can have bleeding if there are ulcerations in the bowel. And significantly importantly, you can have bacteremia with gram-negative sepsis. So in hyperinfection syndrome, it's important not just to treat the worm, but to also cover for bacterial sepsis. So the organism can go not only to the gut, but it can go to the brain, to the gallbladder, to the liver, and how well do we recognize strongyloides infection? I've already confessed that I didn't recognize it in the patient that I was doing the colonoscopy on for colon wall thickening. My infectious disease colleagues from the um, um, uh, international clinic were the ones who made that diagnosis. But in a study of uh, physicians, U.S. trained physicians only recognize strongyloides about 9% of the time. Foreign trained physicians recognize it over half the time. So I confess to you, I feel a little bit of a fraud telling you about a disease that you probably know more about than I do, but my apologies. So the diagnosis uh, with primary infection, we look for an increase in eosinophils. It can be mild, but it's usually there in about three quarters of the patients. Serology can be positive uh, 85 to 100% of the time. If it's negative, it has a pretty good negative predictive value, but the best yield to make the diagnosis is a combination of stool and serology, but in a very acutely ill patient, you really can't wait for a serology to come back. 
It is um, the yield of looking at the stool does vary with the number of stool specimens that you look at. In one study, the yield of finding the larva was 30% for one stool specimen, 78, 70 to 80% for three specimens, and over 90% with seven or more specimens, but most of us don't send more than three specimens. And again, as I mentioned, the ELISA is a negative, uh, excellent screen with a negative, excellent predictive value. So finding strongyloides, screening, serology is best, diagnosing, serology, and stool studies. The important thing about the eosinophilia, and in our patient, that was really the only clue, other than the fact that he was from Ethiopia, was that he had eosinophilia on one of his blood counts before. But with the hyperinfection syndrome, you may not see eosinophilia. And if you're on steroids, you may not see an increase in eosinophils either. So both steroids and the hyperinfection syndrome decrease the eosinophils, so we can't rely on that as we do in our immunocompetent patients. The treatment is ivermectin daily until the organism has cleared. To treat concomitant infections, as I mentioned, the possibility of gram-negative sepsis, and to cautiously decrease immunosuppression as tolerated, recognizing that you don't want to compromise the organ transplant if the patient has a solid organ transplant. So the emergencies associated with strongyloidiasis are GI bleeds, and this is usually from upper GI tract infection, usually in the duodenum. The organism can cause obstruction, or perforation, bowel infarction, we'll hear more about infarction later, obstructive jaundice, pulmonary, the patient that I presented to you had an acute respiratory distress syndrome with pneumonia. Neurologically, you can get abscesses from the brain and meningitis, and then bacteremia. So the take-home points are to consider the diagnosis in high-risk patients, to screen pre-transplant or Perhaps in our IBD patients, we should be screening for this as well, since they're going to be on long-term immunosuppression. Serology is the best, but not very helpful if someone is acutely ill, and one can always consider empiric therapy. In this patient, if it had been thought about, possibly empiric therapy on day one might have been helpful. So just to share with you a picture of our volcano, Mount Rainier, in the background, seen with our space needle in the front ground. Not as many volcanoes as you have, but thank you again for the privilege of being here and for your attention.